Uh, before I start, I'm, I'm still putting together the last, the next problem set, problem set five, <clears throat> and I'm going to make it do. I'm going to try to get up this afternoon and make it do a week from today, so a Friday rather than the usual Wednesday. And the reason for that is that I won't get to the, to the material for the last couple questions until, until Wednesday. Okay? So that's problem, that will be problem set five. Back to material. Uh, well, I ended last time saying that, that all the rest of rocket stuff was details. I have to. There are a few details that are, are worth mentioning, so, I'll, so I will bring them up. Uh, the first one. Uh, the first one has to do with the use of fuel and the, and the, the issues behind trying to get into, into Earth orbit or beyond into the, to, to go to the stars, both, both of which are, are serious challenges and, and why. And part of the problem is that um, I, I told you to some extent last time that rockets have, a, have the problem that they send out their fuel over a long period of time and they accelerate. And, and pick up speed during the process of sending their fuel out backwards. So, so they send it out as fast as they can do it, uh, and they, they use their, their limited, the limited mass of fuel they have on board as, as efficiently as they can. But the fact that late in their, tra in their travels and thrust, they are throwing out fuel that they have already invested forward momentum into reduces the ultimate speed of the spacecraft. It, the spacecraft can, in principle, go as fast as you like. It just keeps on throwing out more fuel, which means there's less and less spacecraft left. So if you're willing to have a spacecraft that's 99.9999999% that's fuel, the last bit of spacecraft that's left will be going very fast, much faster than the exhaust velocity of fuel. But the, but the last bits of, of, of its propulsion involves sending out fuel that was traveling almost as fast as the spacecraft will eventually move. And so it, long and short of it is that the, the rocket gets less, ends up with less forward speed. This is the naive, the naive equation for the velocity of the spaceship is where, the, where you got ship versus fuel. That if you, if you look at the ratio of fuel to ship, so, so how much huger the fuel you, that you send out is than the, ultimately the ship that's going to go at full speed. If you look at, take that ratio and multiply by the velocity which you throw the fuel back outward, and the minus sign just deals with the fact that fuel is going to the, the left where the ship's going to the right. You can go very fast, just have lots of fuel, very little ship. This ratio becomes very dinky, uh, no, very huge, and the ship ends up going many times as fast as the fuel was thrown out the tail. That's the naive equation. Alas, the real equation, what what's, I guess is known as the, the rocket equation, and if you read through it once, I guess I, I would define you as a rocket scientist, at least temporarily, OK? Uh, you don't quite get this high a, a speed. It, you end up with a more messy equation that takes into account that you invested a lot of forward momentum in the fuel before you threw it out at the, toward the end of the, the, the thrust period. And so there's a logarithm in, logarithm in it. And uh, you get less final speed. It's significantly less, particularly at very, uh, when you're trying to go very fast. And I don't expect you to, to remember it or even necessarily understand it entirely. But it means that, that, that going very fast in a rocket ship that is several multiples of the exhaust velocity. And the, they try the highest exhaust velocities they can five miles per second, for example. They can't go many times five miles per second fast without heroic efforts. And so what are the real world consequences of this? The real world consequences are that getting, going fast enough to get into, into Earth orbit, and I'll talk about the need for speed there in a minute, um, or going, into this, going to the stars, is tough. And while they have been trying to do this with vehicles that resemble the, the spacecraft that you see in movies, where the vehicle takes off from spaceport Alpha, goes to the stars, comes back and lands entirely intact on spaceport Beta, and then does it again over and over. That's not realistic. Why? 
because the, the vehicle that takes off from space Port Alpha needs to be 99 plus percent fuel to have enough thrust to get the speeds it needs uh, to fight gravity and get off the planet. And therefore, it, it's, it's got to be a, a bottle with a lot of fuel in it. It's hard to make a bottle that's 99, you know, 99% contents and 1% uh, uh, bottle. Uh, you can do it for water, but these aren't, this isn't water. This is, these are crazy chemicals that are dangerous, reactive with everything. They're just hor horrific uh, chemicals. And you've got a lot of them. They have a lot of mass, which you need. It, you know, it, you, the mass is good on one hand. On the other hand, it gets a lot of weight. You're trying to hold up tons of this fuel. They can't make ships that will hold that kind of stuff. And so what they use is staging. So all the rockets that you've seen go off into space are staged, which effectively means that they have a rocket, the big rocket takes off, and it goes to a certain point, uses all its fuel up, and then they throw the shell, the bottle away, and they, a second rocket, in effect, takes off from the first rocket and goes on its way, and eventually maybe it uses all its fuel, they throw away that rocket, and the third little teeny rocket, it's like the Russian dolls stacking on top of each other, sort of. Um, in different eras, the, the obviousness of the staging varied. During the space shuttle era, you know, it, back in the Apollo era, it was very clear they were staged. There was, they called them stage one, stage two. And you'd see the big, big rocket, and sitting on top of it was the littler rocket, and sitting on top of that was the littler still rocket. And you can watch them all go off, one after the next. Um, with the space shuttle, the first stage was the booster rockets and the, and the fuel tank. And the, the second stage, or the second or third, I don't know which, was the actual space shuttle itself. But it was a small fraction of the takeoff weight and mass of, the, of this ship. OK? Um, the reason for throwing away the bottles is because their extra mass, you certainly don't want to take the extra mass to space. You, you use the big rocket to get off, to, to get up to a certain speed, the best it can do, and then you launch the little rocket from greater altitude and greater speed, and it does its trick, and then you launch the next rocket, and so on. That means that you know, the, the Millennium Falcon type rocket zipping around, uh, it, it's not going to happen. All right, unless somebody, you know, they discover some new physics, it's just not going to happen. All right, any questions about the, the need for staging rockets and speed issues? Um, okay, other things to talk about before I, before I leave it. Um, I actually, before I talk about gravity and, and, and orbit, just to mention that, that uh, rockets, uh, you're now used to seeing some rockets that don't look so much like toy rockets. Toy rockets or, or, or Buck Rogers rockets had fins and, and uh, sleek, sleek looks. Actually, some movie rockets look like that, too, in spacecraft. They're all slick and aerodynamics, all that stuff. When they operate in deep space, there's no air to push against, so having all these fancy frills and, and smooth, streamlined shapes and fins, they do nothing for you. They're useless. Um, those are useful when you're moving through air and you worry about having the air skirt around beautifully around the, the ship without much air resistance and steer the ship by way of its fins. Uh, other, other things that have sort of fins and use the air for, to direct their flight include arrows. The, the fletching on an arrow is designed to keep the tail of the arrow at the back of the arrow, not and not have the arrow pivot around by accident as it's, as it's heading towards the target. Birds have a tail in part so that they end up flying beak forward. They look kind of goofy going sideways through the air. It would also not be very good for it. Yeah, they would not like this. So uh, using the air to orient things, weather vanes use the air to orient. And rockets used to use that. Nowadays, they mostly use their, their own rocket thrust uh, I, should just, I should define that. The act of throwing the fuel, say, to your left, causes the fuel to push on the rocket with a, with a, with a, a force that's simply known generically as, as thrust. And 
if the fuel is thrown direct, if, if, if the ship is oriented like this stick, you know, horizontal straight to, to your right, and it throws the fuel out straight to your left, the rocket is pushed forward by the thrust force whoosh, exactly along its length, and it goes nose first, everything's good. If, for some reason, it began to accidentally rotate as it was flying to your right, you know, this kind of orientation going through air, certainly, and even in space, might be kind of disconcerting to everybody involved. So how do they reorient so that they are pointed the way they like? They actually swivel their rocket exhaust a little bit, or things equivalent to this. They use, instead of sending the rocket exhaust exactly straight out backwards, they send it back and a little down, in this case, and that ex uh, produces a torque on the ship to reorient it, to get it back to flying nose first, if you, assuming you want to fly nose first. In the, in the air, you do. Once you're in space, who cares? Uh, once, once, you're, once these ships are in space, um, the orientation which they fly through, through empty space makes no difference. So what, what, how, to do with this, how to summarize this? When you're in the air, being aerodynamically sleek and streamlined matters. You can use fins to help you orient if you want. Once you're out of the air, fins do nothing. Streamline does nothing. Orientation is, is, is arbitrary unless, you want, unless your rocket engine can only push out the tail, in which case, if you want to accelerate that way, you better orient yourself so the tail uh, points that way, so you shoot your rocket exhaust that way and get pushed in the direction you had in mind. All right. So satellites can look like school buses, you know, zipping around. They can orient themselves this way, that way, whatever they like. There's no air up there for all, for all practical purposes. So being streamlined, who cares? Orienting, choose what orientation is good for you. Any questions about aiming and pointing rockets? OK, my last topic to, to, to attend to is, is the, the world of orbits, which I'll do, give short shrift, but I'll do it anyway. First off, the, the, the spacecraft and astronauts as well in Earth orbit are not genuinely weightless. They don't have zero weight. Gravity's still there. It's still pulling on them. They are not that much farther from the center of the Earth than you are right now. As a result, they, their weights are very close to their surface of the Earth weights. A little smaller, and, and the, 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 the law, the, well, at least the, the Newtonian law uh, of, of universal gravitation, which describes how strongly, ultimately it, point, it, it says what their weight is, but it, it, it's more general, actually. It, it, it says how strong the gravitational forces are between any two objects. Uh, it turns out that, that the relationship, and this one is another one I don't expect you to remember, so if you want to zone out, go ahead. But uh, there is a constant known as a gravitational constant that simply sets the, the strength of gravity. It's actually very, gravity is very weak, so this is a small constant on the grand scheme of things. Uh, for the, for, if you want to look at the weight of the ship and the weight of the Earth, if you want to look at the weight of the ship orbiting the Earth, the, the weight of that ship is the mass of the ship times the mass of the Earth. Of course, the mass of the ship is modest. The mass of the Earth is humongous, and that compensates for the fact that the gravitational constant is small. And the strength of that weight is, uh, has one other factor in it. The distance between the center of the ship and the center of the Earth, their gravitational centers, squared. So what's the, what, what's the, what are the takeaways from this? The strength of the gravitational attraction, and it's, gravity is always attractive, between any two objects, including you and your neighbor, um, it is equal to this gravitational constant, the mass of one object times the mass of the other object, divided by their separation, squared. So as they get farther away, the separation gets bigger. Separation squared gets a lot bigger. And one over that gets a lot smaller. So gravity gets weaker with distance quite rapidly, faster than just proportional. It goes as a square. Of uh, the reason we only experience weight due to the Earth is, is also pretty clear from this relationship. The, ma the only thing with a mass big enough to get our attention is the Earth. And even though it's quite far away from us, effectively, it is, its center is, is 4,000 miles down, 
it's still so much mass that, that, that it creates a substantial weight. Uh, the moon creates a, a tiny weight for you. Uh, we'll see the moon show up in, in it's, it doesn't affect us directly, but it does affect the Earth's oceans enough to create tides. So we pretty much only notice weight due to the Earth. Uh, in a laboratory, you can actually observe the weight due to like one bowling ball pulling on another bowling ball. And amazingly enough, it is, it is possible to study gravity between household objects. Um, you got to get, you know, it's hard, but you can do it. So, having introduced, and this is just the, the grand statement, uh, the, law, the law of universal gravitation. Uh, and it is, it is a Newtonian law in the sense that it's, it's classical physics. It's been known for, for centuries, this law. Uh, it is an excellent approximation to a more uh, sophisticated law that showed up at the beginning of about 1912, I think, which is Einstein's theory of general relativity, which, which, for which this is an a, a extremely good approximation for almost every case except the really wacky aspects of, of, our, of our universe, like black holes and stuff, where this is no longer quite right. All right, so this is good enough for nearly everything you do. Orbits, then. Once a, a ship is above the Earth's atmosphere, the only thing acting on it is gravity, and if it, unless it's got a, its rocket uh, engine still, thru, still producing thrust, once it turns off its, its engine or runs out of fuel, it's now just a falling object. It's just an object experiencing its weight and nothing else, and so it begins to fall. And the question is, what happens as a result of that falling? I mean, if it gets far enough away from the Earth, the, the gravity becomes so weak that the local acceleration due to gravity out there in the, in the boonies is dinky, and it'll be a long time before anybody will notice something's up and that we're falling. But in all the orbits that, that, uh, have, that people have been in since the Apollo era, uh, they're close to the Earth, and they are falling toward the Earth. And why don't they hit, and I, and I talked about this bits and pieces before, but if they were motionless way up high, they would be experiencing their downward weight, they would have a downward acceleration to gravity, not quite as big as the local one here, 9.8 meters per second, but it might be 9.6 meters per second squared. In any case, they would pick up speed, uh, they would accelerate downward, their velocity would be downward, their velocity would get bigger and bigger downward, they'd pick up more speed, and then smack. Not good. So how do they avoid that? The way to avoid that is don't be motionless way up there. Be up there, but have a, a, a sideways velocity that's really big. If you do that, you, you still fall. You still accelerate toward the center of the Earth, but that causes your velocity to, to, rot, to, to change directions. Uh, it might speed you up and slow you down, which is a, another issue, but, it, but, but uh, if you keep roughly the constant velocity, if you, go fa if you choose the right velocity to start with for your local, uh, for your altitude, instead of speeding up or slowing down, you simply uh, sh sh uh, steer your velocity. And so here's the spaceship, maybe, going uh, to the left. It's accelerating towards the center of the Earth, as it, as it should for a falling object, but it never makes any progress toward the Earth. There are really sort of two things battling it out. There is its inertial tendency to go straight. So if all there were were inertia and, and its current momentum, it would go straight and true whoosh, off there and take out the clock. So inertia wants it to go to higher and higher altitude. Here it is at a certain altitude. If it gets, goes out here, it's, going, it, its altitude is increasing. Right? It's now way, way above the Earth's surface. So inertia favors higher altitude. On the other hand, it's being pulled downward, and it is falling. And the pull of gravity favors lower altitude. It's pulling the thing, come, you know, come this way. So if inertia dominates, for example, if you take a tremendous velocity to the left, the, the, the acceleration toward the center of the Earth is just crushed, doesn't, just doesn't, doesn't matter. And phew, it goes off inertial. So that's what happens if you go super fast. You, you, instead of a simple orbit around the Earth, you just go off into the deep space. On the other hand, if you go too slow, then gravity dominates. 
and your altitude decreases as you, as you, as you head along and eventually you smack. Okay? So if you get those two just right, just the right velocity, not to go inertial and leave the Earth by going to higher altitude, and not so, to go so slow that falling wins and you go, get close to the Earth, you just you get the in-between. And that's what, th those are orbits, um, looping orbits, what are really known, known as elliptical orbits. They, they actually do follow a mathematical curve uh, known as an ellipse. One, one example of an ellipse, a special case of an ellipse is a circle. So a lot of orbits are nearly circular. If they're not quite circular, then they're, they're close cousins of circular, which are the ellipses. So all the, the stuff that's up there around the Earth, all the satellites, the space station, astronauts when they're up there doing things, they're, they're in orbits around the Earth. They're, in, they're falling, they're not hitting the Earth because they're going sideways so fast that the, the balance between inertial motion and falling motion takes them in, in loops around the Earth. They have to go pretty fast to achieve, to, to, to avoid go, descending, going to lower altitude. It's about 17,000 miles per hour. This dictates the time it takes to go around the loop, somewhere around 90 minutes. So the fact that, that astronauts orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, they don't have a lot of choice in this. It's, that's the speed they need to do to make circular orbits in free fall. If they want to take longer to go around the Earth, they have to, go to, to, they have to get farther from the center of the Earth. Gravity gets weaker. The loop gets bigger, so they've got more distance to travel. And they can, they can slow down their actual speed, and they, they have more distance to travel, so it takes longer. And if you go out to about, yeah, I should know the number of these numbers. Is it 20,000 20, miles from the center of the Earth? So it's something like that. Uh, it, it takes an entire day to go around. And so a lot of satellites that you're used to interacting with, uh, the ones that, that, that carry uh, communication, video, television, that kind of stuff, those, those, are, uh, those orbit the Earth once every day, and they're located deliberately over the equator heading east. And why would you do this? Why, you know, doesn't that sort of pack everybody into the same little narrow world, this little sort of tube of space they were going through? The reason for that is they become what are known as geosynchronous. They're taking a day to go around the Earth while the Earth is taking a day to just simply rotate on its axis. And they stay over the same spot then. They, they're over the equator. They can't go, you could, you could make them go off the equator, but then they wouldn't hover over exactly the same spot. But they just sort of sit above a spot, whipping around, not getting any closer to the Earth because their inertia is keeping them up there. So these satellites that you can aim at and, and expect them to be there all day, every day, those are geosynchronous orbits. Any other questions about orbiting stuff? You know, I could go on forever, but I'll stop. I think that now does it for rockety stuff. Any, any other things, things you, you care about with rockets? Yeah, Dakota? So the question is about, the fuel keeps coming out of the rocket at the same speed. I'm sorry, I'll, re, I'll interpret. It keeps coming out of five miles per second from the rocket. But look at, look at its actual speed as viewed by the, by the people who watch the rocket take off. At the first moments, when the rocket is, is, is motionless on the launch pad, that, that fuel is going backwards at five miles per second. It's carrying a lot of momentum with it. But the rocket begins to pick up speed then. And it continues to throw out the fuel from its perspective at five miles per second. But from the perspective of the people on, on the uh, launch pad who are looking, they're saying the rocket is going forward, let, let, let's say, it at two miles per second. Well, it's going that way at two miles per second, throwing its fuel out five miles per second to, to the left from your, from your perspective. That's only really three miles per, per second from your perspective. It's carrying away less momentum. Than, he, than, the, than the, the first dose, the first kilogram that went out, poof, five miles per second. The, one, the, the, kilo, the kilogram that went out now, it only goes out at three, three kilometers per second, as viewed by the, by the people standing on the side. And down the road, some of that fuel will actually come out 
still heading to the left, to the right, as viewed by the people on the ground. Because the rocket's going so fast, 100 kilometers per I'm, Am I mixing all my, my, my units? 10 miles per second. It throws the fuel out at, at, from its perspective at 5 miles per second. That fuel is actually heading from, your pers from the, gr the ground people. It's, it's heading to the right at 5 miles per second. Um, it, it's very fast moving in the direction the rocket is go going. So it, it, having taken that fuel all the way up to a high speed and then throw it out was a big waste. It's unfortunate. Hmm? It is still useful, just not as much. Because you, you can sort of think of this as, as a series of rockets. E each one, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even go that direction. It, it, the fact that you had to invest so much for momentum into the fuel before you threw it out. Uh, I don't have a good line of argument for why it's, it's still useful because it's from, it, from the perspective of the rocket, you, it can, given its current speed, whatever that speed is, if it throws stuff to, to your left, it will, it will pick up a little speed to the right. The question is sort of how much of a push does it get? It becomes less and less efficient. They've invested so much fuel in, They've, they've used a lot of fuel just to get this portion of fuel uh, to be there for, for you to push on now. And a miracle occurs and as a result. It's hard, I, I can't, while, while just doing this, give you a good argument for, you can certainly see why it's still useful. The question is how useful, it's just getting diminishing, diminishing returns. I have to leave it at that. Other questions? So that will bring us, anything more I wanted to say? Nah, that's good. Oh, I, I will make one more harangue, and that is about the, about the rockets. I, I've, I've told you this before, but now you're in a position to actually understand it better, I hope. Space tourism, which is, you know, it'll become a thing during your life, and maybe it already is, sort of. Um, the, 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 the current rocket stuff, they are, are going up into space and then coming straight back down, more or less straight back down. That's relatively easy because you get up to 100 miles, say, using a, a, a vehicle that's 50% fuel or maybe 70% fuel. That's, you can pull that off. But, but you're not in orbit. To get in orbit, you have to... Not, if you think, think about what's their velocity when they get to 100 miles, it's zero. They, it's the, it's the, the high point of a, basically a ball thrown up in the air. So they're not moving up there. If they want to be in orbit, they have to not be not moving up there. They have to be moving sideways at 17,000 miles per hour, which is really fast. And that takes a huge amount of additional fuel. So the difference between getting a rocket to 100 miles up and motionless and 100 miles up and moving like 17,000 miles an hour is a huge difference. And you need all the staged rockets and a lot of effort, and most of the, the uh, process of taking a, a, a rocket to orbit is uh, using the rocket thrust to pick up speed. Picking up the altitude is not, not hard. Picking up the speed is hard. So, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I did say this, the rockets after they take off, they go, they go up briefly vertically and then they, then they tip and they start, they start working. And usually they, they tip toward the east. Why? Because they're already moving sideways as we all are at a good, you know, pu pushing a fraction of, of 1,000 miles an hour. The, the Earth is turning, after all. Uh, actually, launching from the equator is particularly efficient because at the equator, you really are traveling eastward at, at over 1,000 miles per hour. So it, it helps in building up towards, a, towards an orbit. Liam? Once you get going in orbit, how do you, how do you get the rocket back down? Once they're up in orbit with no thrust going on, they'll, go, they'll go do this essentially forever. There's a little bit of, of air resistance, which brings stuff down eventually. But most of the time, when they want to go to do something different, they change their orbit. So if they want to go to, for example, the moon, what do they do? They speed up. They, allow, they give inertia the advantage over the falling. They go to higher altitude. And if they pick it high enough, they actually leave the Earth and head off toward the moon. If they want to come down in altitude, they want to give falling the advantage over inertia. They slow down. 
So that's why they use, they talk about retro rockets in the old days. Now they just simply turn the vehicle around, they fire its thrust in the direction they're heading, and that slows them down. And when they do that, falling begins to win, and they go to lower altitude, and they come in and land. They don't go to, they don't go to zero, it doesn't become a free fall. Well, it is, a, it is always a free fall, but it, it's, um, they, it's a very delicate balancing issue that ultimately they use the air for, for, good, and, for good and evil. They, use, they, they work with the air. They, they certainly they don't have to slow down very much before they begin to go to lower altitude, significantly lower altitude, and they begin to enter the Earth's atmosphere. Once they do that, then they start experiencing all these aerodynamic forces, which they got to deal with. And there's heating associated with that. You know, it's all kinds of. But eventually, they slow down and come down. You know, either by parachute or by. But yeah, they, in the absence of air, so so landing on the moon, uh, then they have to slow down entirely with rocket exhaust because they've, they've got nothing else to to uh, to push against. So landing on the moon. Fortunately, the moon's small, uh, and you can land on. Um, Landing on Mars, they use, they use parachutes. They still have an atmosphere to work with. But, but landing on an on a, on a Earth-sized planet with no atmosphere will be really tough. Other questions? Good questions. All right, so I'll leave, uh, leave rockets. Balloons. So now we'll, start, we'll, start, we'll, bring, the, we'll bring in the air. Uh, up until this point, you know, there, was a, there was a long early stretch in this course where I, I pretended friction didn't exist, and now we know it exists. And up until this point, I've pretended air doesn't exist for the most part, but now it exists. So let's start seeing how, the, how air interacts with things. First, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of look at things in air, and then we'll sort of look at air flowing past, past things. Uh, I, I spend more time lo looking at fluids in this, in this class than most physics classes do, but you guys interact with fluids all the time. So sort of giving them, it's worth giving them some attention. You interact a lot with air, you interact a lot with water, other, li other liquids and fluids, and so on. Uh, I should say fluids is just a catch-all for all these substances that can change shape easily. So their gases and liquids are both fluids. It just simplifies things. All right. So an opening question here is that the helium balloon has mass. Nothing, there, there's nothing that's got negative mass and uh, precious little it has zero mass. So a helium balloon really does have mass. If you shook the thing, if you went deep space and gave it a shake, you discover it's got inertia and all that stuff. The weird thing though with helium is it doesn't fall to the floor, it actually goes up. So the so question is, is there a real force pushing up on a helium balloon? And, now we're in a world where air, air is, I, I'm, not saying, I, I'm not saying neglect air. Don't, okay. How many think there's a real force pushing up in the balloon? How many think there's no force pushing, no real force? Okay, yeah, once you're in the air, as we'll see, as I'll, as I'll try to show you. you know, this thing is really experiencing forces due to the air. Yeah, <laughs> boom, my head pops up, right? Since I got the helium container here, <laughs> why, do I, why do I use the smallest, the world's smallest balloon? <laughs> These ones are all small. All right. So this really does have mass, and shaking it, yeah, there's inertia there. If there were no atmosphere around and they let go of this, it would have a weight and nothing else, and it would fall to the ground at 9.8 meters per second. It would go thunk. It would drop just like a rock. But it has this weird property that it goes up, and it is being lifted by a real force. The air itself is pushing on that balloon from all sides, and it'll be, you know, as, of course it'll be there until tomorrow, it'll be on the floor, but that's, that's life. 
<laughs> Hello, here I am. I'm talking about <laughs> physics today, and I'm full of helium, and I have to breathe it all out. Otherwise, I will pass out, and that won't be very good. So, <laughs> That's relevant, but it's a little ahead of schedule. The, the speed of sound in air, in helium, is faster than it is in air because the mass is smaller. And so, so the, the sound waves propagate more easily and faster through it. And the result is that all the resonant structures that make up my voice become effectively smaller. The, the, the sound travels so quickly through them that it's as though they were smaller. So it's as though I were just a little mini me here. Yeah. All right. So there's good, there's good physics. That was, it. that was a necessary demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So some observations about balloons. They're held, held taut by the, the air that's inside them, or whatever gas you put inside them. Some balloons float in air. Some other, others don't. I mean, uh, unlike, uh, alas, the cartoons where a person blows up a balloon and then floats away, that, that does not happen. Uh, air, an air-filled balloon will not float, whatever floating exactly means, will not float in ordinary air. Uh, you have to fill the balloon with something lighter than air. Uh, examples of that are helium and hot air, which, which is what we'll go after. OK? So how, just to start with, how does, how does air manage to inflate a balloon? So that's, that's what we'll start with. And that is uh, that the, the air has, has, a, has a characteristic known as pressure. And so what's pressure? Well, to, just to sort of set this, get things started, when you push on something, if I were to push on the wall over there, it would make sense for us to define the strength of my push in terms of just simply how hard I push. 10 pounds of force would be a, in the sort of the American unit system, or 30 newtons of force in the SI or metric system. Uh, and you would know where I pushed, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I'm simply an amount of force and, and the location, perhaps, of that, of that force. Gases and fluids don't push the same way that we do. They don't sort of reach out and push there. They push on whole surfaces. So that, that wall over there on the right is immersed in a, in a fluid known as air, and the air is pushing on that wall, but it's not pushing at any one place. It's pushing on the whole surface. And it's pushing you know, how much overall force? Well, a big amount that we could figure out. But, but it turns out, it's, it's, since it pushes the same on this patch of surface as it pushes on that patch of surface, as it pushes on that patch of surface, it makes sense to sort of, instead of worrying about the whole wall and how hard the force is on it due to the air, you look at each patch and actually pick a, pick a standard patch. One square meter that's, that's, that's this big on a side, OK? Pick that patch. How much push does the, does the air uh, exert on it? Well, over that patch, it pushes a little more than 100,000 newtons, which is a lot of push. There's a lot of force. So it's about 100,000 newton force that it exerts on that patch. And it's not on any one spot on the patch. It's on the whole patch and, and pretty uniformly. So, so the way we describe the push, instead of saying it, a certain force on, uh, on the wall, although that, that you could do that, you say it, it, it exerts a certain force per unit of area on that wall, per, for example, per square meter. How many newtons per square meter are, is the air exerting on that? And the answer is about a, hundred, a little over 100,000 newtons per square meter. Can you follow that idea? Questions about that, that idea? That's known as a pressure. So a pressure is, is, the, is the force that a fluid exerts on something per square, per unit of surface area. So it, the units are, are force per unit of surface area. And the actual value is about 100,000 newtons per, per square meter. Um, I should, newtons per square meter is a mouthful. So there's a shorthand name for it. It's been named, it's got its own personal name. It's called a Pascal. So it's about 100,000 Pascals. Exactly the same as 100,000 newtons per square meter. Uh, just to put things in perspective, 100,000 newtons is like the weight of a school bus. So on each square meter of, of, of that wall surface, and oddly enough, 
each square meter of the floor, each square meter of the ceiling, each square meter of you, the air is pushing with a force of about a school bus per square meter. A lot of force. And you might think, well, if that's real, why don't we notice it? Because a lot of things that are happening are, are, uh, resemble this. This sheet of paper, on, this, on the left side of the sheet of paper, the air is pushing on that with a pressure of 100,000 pascals. Tremendous force on this surface. To figure out what the, what the actual force is, you need to know what that surface area is. And let's say it's a tenth of a square meter, which is ballpark, right? So there's about a 10,000 newton force, 10,000 newtons pushing on this to the right. It's real. Why does the sheet of paper manage to sit here in equilibrium? It's not accelerating, right? Zero net force. Well, it's because the air on this side is pushing back equally hard with its own, about, about 10,000 newtons. And so the, the paper is being squished from both sides with, with forces of about, about 10,000 newtons. Is that okay? It seems impossible. I, I mean, I, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of push. How would you ever notice that force? Because this, this is balanced. On us, it's balanced. I mean, my, 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 my right side is being pushed to your right uh, with lots of force, and left sides, you know, it balances. It just keeps balancing, it keeps balancing. It's not, it, we will find exceptions, but it's, uh, it's pretty well balanced out. Nothing much happens. To, 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 to unbalance it, let's take the air away from one side. I can't do it with a sheet of paper, but I can do it with, with one side of this, this, this hemisphere. So, so it's a half, a half a hollow ball. I'm going to leave the air in place on this side, on the green painted side. I'm going to take the air away from the black internal side. And the way to do this is, of course, to have two. If we take the air out from inside this pair of hemispheres, then the air will be pushing inward with this force I've claimed it's there. It's not a, you know, it's not, it's getting pretty small, so it's some fraction of a, of a square meter, like a, a hundredth. But there'll be a big force this way on this, on the, the right side, and there'll be a big force to the right on the left side. They'll be pushed towards each other hard. And I, I could use a, two people to try to pull these babies apart once we take the air out from between them. Two people? Kate? Someone else? We'll, we'll work out. It'll be me then. We'll do it. Okay. So I am going to take the air out. Do I have the right plumbing? I need plumbing for this. This will do. All right. Yeah, c come on up. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. So right now, they're, they're loose. I'm going to use a device that will pump the air out. What it's really doing is it's allowing the air to flow spontaneously out due to its own pressure, and then not letting it go back. So is this working? Yeah. OK, well, we're watching the air being sucked out. This, this, this will go over to somewhere over there, about 700-ish. So already you can see something happened. This is a small version of what are known as the Magdeburg hemispheres. When it was originally demonstrated like 200-ish years ago, they were much bigger hemispheres, and there were horses trying to pull them apart unsuccessfully. So there's almost no air now between those. So each of the hemispheres now is in a terrible, unbalanced situation. It's being, not being pushed outward, but it's being pushed inward by the surrounding air pressure tremendously. All right. So this should be, we should be done here. Yeah, OK. 
You get that side, I get this side. Be prepared, occasionally they do come apart, but it's not gonna be easy, okay? I'm sliding. <laughs> yeah, we can't do it, right? But if we let the air back in, okay? So the point of this, the takeaway, thank you. The takeaway is that air is pushing very hard on surfaces. You don't notice it because it's usually balanced. If you, if you unbalance it, if you take the air away from one of the surfaces, suddenly you have a, a huge force pushing on these surfaces. And these, these are familiar examples of this. this is, I'm thinking of, of, of trying to open a door underwater, but that's a bad example. Well, uh, where else did you see this? Well, you've noticed when, when, when you get pressure imbalances that show up because of wind, for example, trying to open doors on certain days in certain buildings, they're very hard to open because the, the air pressure is different on the two surfaces. And the, the, that means one, one surface is being pushed harder than the other, and they, the forces can be enormous to the point where you can't open the doors. Okay? So, uh, in answer then to this original question, how does a balloon, uh, you know, what's holding a balloon's skin outward? It's air pressure, and actually it's a slight difference in air pressure. So, this balloon, has, it's, a, it's got an elastic skin that, would, that does not, you know, in fact, doesn't like to be this big. It's been stretched. So what in the world is stretching it? What's stretching it is a difference in pressure between a slightly above, a, 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 a slightly higher pressure in the middle of the balloon than there is outside. This pressure out here, that, where, where our hands are and stuff, just, we call this atmospheric pressure, just to make life simple. It's got a value. It varies a little bit from place to place and with the weather and stuff, but it's basically this is atmospheric pressure here. And the pressure inside the balloon now is a little above atmospheric pressure, and as a result, there is a net force on every square portion of surface. And it's, it's towards the lower pressure. The higher pressure pushes harder toward the low pressure, then the low pressure pushes toward the high pressure. There's a net force towards, there's a, there's a, the sum of the pressure forces is toward lower pressure. Okay, so the air is, pulling out enough to withstand the, the inward pull of the elastic rubber, okay? Um, another example, we're at sort of the right time to do this. Uh, if I put that balloon, yeah, let me start with that balloon. If I, you know, it's a little bit higher pressure inside than outside, it's pushing out, it's assuming that the air outside will push in, but what if we take the air outside away? Sorry about this balloon. So now, we'll take the air away from outside the balloon. And as that happens, the air inside the balloon is pushing against less and less inward force. So it begins to stretch the balloon more and more. Can you see that it's stretching? And eventually, that's, the balloon skin won't be able to take it. So if, you ever, if you've ever wondered what happens to helium balloons when you let go of them, they go to higher and higher altitude where the pressure gets smaller and smaller for reasons we'll deal with on Monday. And eventually, they burst. All right. So balloons burst, and because it's fun, you, what, what makes a marshmallow? A marshmallow is little bubbles of, of air around uh, where the skin isn't rubber, because it wouldn't taste very good, but it's, it's, it's a sugar syrup. So if we make, we make Marshmallow Man here, there, get your arms up here, Marshmallow Man's head, Marshmallow Man's, we put Marshmallow Man in here, Sorry about this. The size of the bubbles is dictated in large part by the, this pressure, these pressure issues. The bubbles want to get smaller, the air pushes out, the air on the outside pushes in. If we take away the air outside, the bubbles will get bigger because they're pushing, there's nothing pushing back on them. So Marshmallow Man will bulk up and 
There's Marshmallow Man. And these are ill-gotten gains because Marshmallow Man is bulking up without doing the work, right? Steroids only. And we all know what happens. So as the bubbles get bigger and bigger, and like the rubber uh, balloon bubble, they eventually burst and the air leaks out. And Marshmallow is getting to that point where the bubbles are about as big as they can get without bursting. Um, another way to inflate those bubbles is to heat up the air. As we, it, if you ever toasted marshmallows, they bulk up the same way, not because we take away the air outside, but we heat up the air inside and, the, and that air develops higher pressure as a result. Okay, so, so Marshmallow Man has bulked up about as much as he can, can do it. He's beginning to lose air from his bubbles. And if we now turn off the pump and let the air back in. Oh no! <sighs> they still taste the same, but they don't look the same. All right. So hopefully you, you get something from the demonstrations. We'll, we'll uh, get back to more balloon stuff on Monday.